Amen. So happy to see you all here today. Was particularly encouraged when I kept looking over my left shoulder and seeing my front row here praising the Lord. Just truly encouraged by that. Um, Today we're continuing our study through the book of Genesis and our text tonight is Genesis 25 verses 29 through 34. So if you will turn there in your Bibles, you can follow along with me as I read our text for tonight. Genesis 25, starting in verse 29. Now Jacob cooked a stew, and Esau came in from the field, and he was weary. And Esau said to Jacob, please feed me with that same red stew, for I am weary. Therefore his name was called Edom. But Jacob said, sell me your birthright as of this day. And Esau said, look, I'm about to die. So what is this birthright to me? Then Jacob said, swear to me as of this day. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and stew of lentils. Then he ate and drank, arose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we ask, Lord, that you enter into this study with us, Lord God. That, God, you speak through me, Lord, the words that you have placed on my heart, and that, Lord, we glean from this passage what it is, God, that you want us to take. Would you want us to internalize And live out in our lives, God, what you want us to be able to instruct others with. Have your way, Lord God. Teach us, direct us, strengthen us. Draw us all to a closer, more intimate relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. And if by chance, Lord, someone is watching this message and does not know you as their Savior, I pray, Lord, that today they will open their heart and receive Jesus and be born again. Lord, we ask all these things in the precious name of Jesus for his glory and sake we pray. Amen. Amen. Our passage this evening is both a warning and an encouragement to us. And that warning and encouragement is simply this. Do not despise your birthright. Do not despise your birthright. In Genesis 25, 28, our last verse from last week, we were told, and Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Two very different men, twins, yes, but very different in interest and character. Verse 29 says, Now Jacob cooked a stew. Jacob is a homebody. We saw that last week. He spends his time at home with his mom. He likes to cook. He probably does most of the cooking. And Rebecca, I'm sure, would love that, right? Jacob is her boy. And he not only liked to cook, he obviously is a great cook. Verse 29 continues, Esau came in from the field and he was weary. Esau is out working all day in the field. He's tired. He's hungry. He comes home and the house is filled with the aroma of Jacob's stew. So here is a very important lesson for us to learn. When our bodies are needy, we're vulnerable, and we must be vigilant. When Jesus was at the point of his greatest need, and he went to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray to the Father, Matthew 26, 37 through 38 tells us, and he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. And he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. 
Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Stay here and watch with me. Jesus pours out his heart to his closest disciples, and he asked them in that great moment of need, stay here and watch with me. This is when Jesus goes a little further in the garden and he prays, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Matthew 26, 40 and 41. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, what? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray. Lest you enter into temptation, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Jesus goes away a second time. He, he prays the exact same thing. He is in agony. Jesus is facing what he knows will be the worst point he has ever experienced in all of eternity when his body is ravaged, when he has the sin of the world poured on him while he hangs on that cross. And he is desperately seeking the Father. He comes back and he finds him asleep again. He leaves a third time, again, praying, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. He comes back and he asks his disciples, are you still sleeping? Get up. My betrayers are here. At Jesus' greatest hour of need, at the point of the most intense emotional agony that you can imagine, he wanted his close friends there to watch with him. And they failed him. Why did they fail him? they was tired. Jesus said it. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. We need to recognize that our flesh is weak. And that when we are very tired or very hungry, we're vulnerable to do stupid things and make bad decisions. We must be trained to deny our flesh and resist the urge to prioritize physical comfort over godliness. Most of us know about training. We've, we've trained for our careers. If you've served in the military, you were trained. You didn't just show up one day, they give you a uniform and a weapon and say, all right, go to your unit. That would have been a disaster. You had to go through training, basic training, and then more advanced individualized training in order to function as a soldier. You had to learn how to deny your flesh. You had to learn how to function in hard times. You had to learn to pay attention to detail even when you were exhausted. Training. We must be trained to deny our flesh and resist the urge to prioritize physical comfort over godliness. You must know that the devil understands the weakness of your flesh and he will exploit it. That is so, why so many fall into so many types of sin, especially in including sexual sin. It's because they have not learned Christ. Look at Ephesians 4, 17 through 24 with me. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because the blindness of their heart. Paul starts out saying, don't walk like those that don't know Christ. 
They're ignorant. They're blind. You know him, so you should not walk like them. Verse 19 says, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness and greediness. But you have not so learned Christ. See, when a person continues to give into their fleshly appetites, their conscience no longer restrains them and they are past feeling. Verse 21, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. If you have heard Jesus, if you have been trained and taught by Jesus, the truth is in Jesus. The godly life requires us to be trained in righteousness. Verse 22, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. We need to learn to deny our flesh. Do you realize that that was the very first lesson that Jesus had to learn at the onset of his ministry. Jesus had never existed as a human in a human body. And now he came and he put on this flesh. He laid aside the right to be God. He was going to walk just as you and I walked. And the first lesson he had to learn was to deny that flesh. Matthew chapter 3 records the official start of Jesus' ministry when he was baptized by John the Baptist. Matthew 3, verse 16 and 17. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. This is the start of Jesus's ministry. God commissioned him. God spoke. This is my beloved son. Jesus said we must fulfill all righteousness when he went to John the Baptist. John the Baptist was like, whoa, you coming to me? To be baptized, I need to be baptized by you. And Jesus said, nope, got to do this to fulfill all righteousness. God spoke from heaven and Jesus' ministry was started. The narrative continues in the very next verse, Matthew 4, 1 through 11. Then Jesus was led up by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Mark's gospel uses the word immediately in this account. As soon as God spoke to Jesus, as soon as Jesus came up out of the waters of baptism, the Holy Spirit led him to the wilderness. Verse 2, and when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Some of you guys, if you fast for 40 minutes, you're hungry, right? Right? Now, when the tempter came to him, he said, if you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. The devil tempted Jesus when he had been deprived of food and water for 40 days and 40 nights. Jesus' body was no different from yours or mine. He was very hungry and very thirsty. And the first tempt the temptation was an assault on what Philippians chapter 2 describes, where Jesus emptied himself when he left heaven. You see, although Jesus never ceased to be God, not for one second, he laid aside his glory and all the privileges of being God in order to walk this earth just as you do and just as I do. 
Jesus didn't come to do his own will. He came to do the will of the Father. Because he was hungry, the devil was tempting him to take back what Philippians said he didn't hold on to, his right of equality with God. The devil tempted him to take it back in order to meet his own needs and make bread. Verse 4, but he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. He was still hungry. His flesh was still crying out for that bread, but he denied his flesh and he said, no, I'm going to feed my spirit. Man does not live by bread alone. Now, let me state the obvious. Making bread is not a sin. Jesus made bread in his ministry to feed thousands. Remember the fish and the loaves? Jesus made bread out of nothing. The sin here would be not following God's will and performing a miracle to fulfill the cravings of his flesh. That would be the sin. Verse 5, then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone. The devil using the word of God to try and convince Jesus to jump off the top of the temple and commit suicide. After you have been eaten for 40 days and 40 nights, you might be tempted to jump off the top of a building as well, right? So he takes him to the top. If you're the son of God, jump. Verse 7, Jesus said to him, it is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Jesus did not come to do his own will. He did not come to prove anything to the devil. Jesus came to do the will of the Father. Verse 8, again, the devil took him on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship him. The devil now is offering Jesus fame, fortune, and power. All of my visions of the rich and famous revolve around huge banquet tables filled with all kind of goodies. And I'm sure that was part of the vision here as well. Jesus is starving. And he's saying, you can have all this. You can live a glorious life here if you just fall down and worship me. Why would that even be a temptation for Jesus, having come from glory, right? Because he could have chose to go back to glory. And that also would have been the devil achieving his objective. Jesus conceding defeat and for forgetting to fulfill his mission of redemption. But no, verse 10, Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him and behold, angels came and ministered to him. Jesus passed the test. The Bible says if we resist the devil, he will flee us. Jesus resisted the devil with the word of God. The devil left. Hebrews 5, 8 and 9 says, Though he, Jesus, was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Jesus had to learn to deny his flesh. And his first test was in that desert after 40 days and 40 nights of not eating or drinking and being tempted by the devil. Jesus denied his flesh then, and he continued to deny his flesh throughout 
his life, culminating with death on the cross. And we have been given the assignment to do the same, to deny our flesh. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Discipline, training. Paul said, if I was to just go with what my flesh want, I too would be disqualified. But I discipline my body. I bring it into subjection. Verse 30 of our text in Genesis 25. And Esau said to Jacob, please feed me with that same red stew, for I am weary. Therefore, his name was called Edom. Edom means red. He's asking for that red stew. Esau's request was reasonable. He's hungry, and he's asking his brother to feed him. And Jacob is more than willing to accommodate his brother, but at a price. Jacob is ambitious, and he knows that his brother is weak in his flesh. So he seizes the opportunity. Verse 31, but Jacob said, sell me your birthright as of this day. What a request. Can you even believe that request? I mean, the right of the firstborn granted him not only a double portion, but he would be the one that the promises of Abraham are given to. He would be the one to inherit all of Canaan, and the promised Messiah would flow through his loins. I can't even imagine making a request like that with a straight face. You would think Esau would just laugh and say, you're crazy, and walk away. We see now that Jacob's name matches his character. He is a heel catcher. He's pulling, striving to get ahead. His desire is to supplant, to su exploit his brother's weakness for his own gain. Verse 32, and Esau said, look. I'm about to die. So what is this birthright to me? Esau is in no way about to fall down and die at that moment if he doesn't eat, right? But it's a great picture of the flesh, what the flesh does. Our flesh convinces us that if we don't get what we want, we'll die. Oh, man, if I don't get this woman, I'll just die. Right? Oh, Lord, if I don't get this man, I'll die. Oh, but he's unsaved. He's, he's unsaved. Trust me. You don't want that man. Trust me, Esau. That stew might be good, but it's not that good. Esau is out of control. He's lacking all reason. And Jacob takes full advantage. Verse 33, then Jacob says, swear to me as of this day. Jacob wants to make this a legal binding contract. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and stew of lentils. Then he ate and drank arose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. He sold his birthright for a stew, lentil stew and some bread. And he ate it. And he got up and walked away like it was nothing. He, he, he gave up everything that was rightfully his in the economy of God. This is a story of all kinds of wrong. There's no doubt that Rebekah told Jacob 
what God had spoken to her when she inquired of God about her troubled pregnancy. Genesis 25, 23. And the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. Two people shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the other, the older, shall serve the younger. You don't think Rebecca shared that with her most favorite son? God had already said. It was already yours. So Jacob knows what God has spoken, but yet he schemes and connives in order to gain what God has already promised him. And that's wrong. We should never see God's favor on our lives by dishonorable means. We should never seek to bring about God's will by striving and conniving. But of course, the far greater wrong in this story is Esau's. Esau made a horrible value judgment. He overvalued immediate pleasure and he grossly undervalued that which carried extreme value, the blessings of God on his life. And now forevermore, we read about Esau's legacy in Hebrews 12, 15 through 17. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. Esau is called a profane person, and he is compared to a fornicator. Why the comparison? You see, a person who is a fornicator, one who is immoral, follows after immediate gratification, despising that which is right, true, and holy. A fornicator cares about pleasing themselves, not God. Fornication or immorality is a sin that is frequently spoken of in God's word. It is included in the list of sins in which if a person demonstrates that lifestyle, the body says they will not inherit the kingdom of God. Look at 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10 with me. It says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Fornication results from the elevation of a natural, normal human function. A natural, normal human desire, sexual fulfillment. But fornication elevates what is natural and normal above the will of God. There are other natural human functions that can cause us to sin. Did you know that too much sleep is sin? The Bible talks about sluggards. It talks about those who are lazy. Gluttony is a sin. Eating too much is a sin. These are things where when we coddle to our flesh, we are training ourselves to give in to that which is in excess of what God's will is. See, God has made provision to give us what we need. God has made provision for our sexual fulfillment. It's called marriage. 
between a man and a woman. You can wait until then. You won't die. God has given us provision to fulfill our bodies with food and drink. But we don't have to eat in excess. We don't have to sleep more than we need to and neglect the things of God. The flesh of man always wants to be coddled. It always wants to be prioritized, but our duty in Christ is to guard against anything that allows our flesh to take control of our lives. Now, the world has no grasp on this truth. Therefore, it's understandable that those people in the world live only for this life. It is all that they know. It is all that they have. But as believers, as children of God, we know better. James 4.14 says, Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time, then vanishes away. You guys know my example. Drop that water on that hot skillet. Psst. You see that little vapor? And it's gone like that. That is our life on earth. It's gone like that, and eternity is forever. Why would we want to prioritize that which is so insignificant compared to that which is so valuable? Matthew 25, 46. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Everybody gets to exist forever. Those that do not know Christ into eternal punishment. Those whose sins have been forgiven into eternal life. We, God's children, know that our time on this earth is short. We know that eternity is what matters most. We are not to despise our birthright. What is our birthright? Our birthright is all of the benefits that we have in Christ Jesus. In Christ, we have forgiveness of sin. In Christ, we have peace with God. In Christ, we have joy unspeakable and full of glory. In Christ, we have the peace that surpasses understanding. In Christ, we claim the promise that all things work together for good to those that love God, to those that are the called according to his purpose. This is our birthright, and we are not to despise our birthright. We are to put on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make no provision for the flesh. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for this passage of Scripture, which shows, dear God, how people can make horrible choices when they do not rely on you, when they do not defer to your word, dear God. And Lord, as your children, dear God, we want to always be found doing your will. We want to follow the example of our Lord Jesus Christ and be obedient children, Lord God, because we know that in that place, that place of obedience, that place in the center of your will is the place where we are most fulfilled. It is in that place, Lord God, where we have your peace. It is in that place, Lord, where nothing that goes on in this world or in our life can touch us and overcome us because we are more than overcomers in you, Lord Jesus, because you love us. Lord, if there's any watching me online, Lord God, or listening to this message that does not know you as Savior, I want to offer them the invitation. If you are listening to me 
and you understand because the Holy Spirit has spoken to your heart while I proclaim God's word that you don't belong to him. You don't have an intimate relationship with him. His desire is to fix that for you right now. And it requires you to repent, which means you choose to turn to God away from your sin and surrender your life to him. It is simple as that. Jesus paid the price for your sin. He died on the cross. He suffered like no one would ever suffer for you. So sin is not the issue anymore. It has been paid. The issue is what will you do with Christ? Will you receive him as your savior? Will you surrender your life to him? If you do, the Bible promise you that you will be born again. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Call on him now. Say, Lord Jesus, I surrender my life to you. Come into my heart and take control of me. I want you to be my savior. He will honor that prayer, sincerely pray from the heart. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for these wonderful saints here tonight. I ask God that you continue to do your work. We're looking for Jesus to come any second. So Lord, let us be faithful. And if you choose to tarry another day, another week, let us be about your business, dear God, living for you and sharing the gospel with as many as will listen. Lord, bring these dear beloved saints of yours home safely. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. Please continue to join us on Sunday as we continue great study in the book of John.